Before constructing a major hydropower project, engineers must be completely certain how water will behave during normal flow, during heavy floods, and even during the most extreme events nature can produce. At NJHEP, one of the most complex river engineering systems ever built, detailed physical hydraulic modeling was essential. To ensure safety and performance, engineers created a 140 scale hydraulic model to replicate every key structure. In this narration, we'll go inside that model, explore how engineers simulated floods up to 12,500 cubic meters per second, and see what they discovered about the spillway, the debris flow channel, sediment basins, vortex formation, and scour control. NJHEP is a run-of-the-river hydropower scheme designed to divert the Neelam River through a 28.5-kilometer headrace tunnel using a massive hydraulic head of 420 meters to generate more than 960 megawatts of electricity. At the dam site, the main structures include a 125-meter long, 47-meter high composite gravity dam, a three-bay radial-gated spillway, a debris flow channel, sediment intake structures, and a three-basin desander system. Downstream, the headrace tunnel carries 284 cubic meters per second towards the powerhouse. Because the safety of the entire system depends on how these structures interact with river hydraulics, the designers required a complete physical model study before finalizing the layout. In theory, hydraulic software can predict velocities, pressures, and water levels. But physical models offer something digital simulations can never fully match real-world behavior of water under complex flow patterns. The NJHEP model was built according to Froud similarity, ensuring that water movement on the model scale correctly represented full-scale physical forces. Engineers needed to examine how water approaches the spillway during flood, whether vortices form near piers and abutments, or high velocities might cause erosion or structural damage how the stilling basin dissipates energy, how floating debris behaves, how sediments settle inside the desander, and how gate operations affect flow safety. These questions could only be answered by running real water through a scaled replica of the entire dam site. The first major test was the spillway's performance with gates fully open, known as free flow conditions. Engineers simulated floods starting from 1,500 cubic meters per second all the way up to the probable maximum flood of 12,500 cubic meters per second. At moderate flows up to the 100-year flood of 4,000 cubic meters per second, the approach conditions were smooth, velocities were well distributed, and the hydraulic jump in the stilling basin remained stable and effective. However, as flows increased to 7,000 cubic meters per second and above, new hydraulic behaviors appeared. The model showed a consistent tendency for the upstream flow to curve toward the left bank. This created higher discharge intensity on the left side of the spillway and induced a strong vortex along the right abutment of the spillway. At discharges of 7,600 cubic meters per second and above, Vortices also formed near other spillway piers. These swirling flows can cause uneven pressure, potential cavitation, and unpredictable forces on the structure. At the PMF of 12,500 cubic meters per second, the water surface rose high enough to overtop the left rock cut downstream of the spillway. Surface velocities exceeded 21 meters per second, extremely high for structural concrete and rock protection. The stilling basin worked effectively up to about 8,000 cubic meters per second. Beyond that, the hydraulic jump began to travel downstream, eventually sweeping out of the basin entirely. When the jump leaves the basin, energy is no longer being dissipated effectively, increasing the risk of erosion and scour downstream. Next, engineers tested the system with the reservoir maintained at elevation 1015 and the radial gates opened to different percentages, 20, 40, 60, 80, and 90 percent. 
At lower gate openings up to 40%, the spillway performed smoothly. Flow conditions upstream of the gates were steady and stable. At 60% opening, the same problem seen during free flow became more pronounced. A strong vortex appeared near the dividing pier on the left side, and circulatory motion developed in front of the debris flow channel on the right side. As gate opening increased, these vortices intensified. By the time the gates were 80 to 90% open, the hydraulic jump had completely moved out of the stilling basin. Downstream velocities reached nearly 30 meters per second. Another issue emerged. The dentated end sill at the end of the stilling basin experienced dangerously high impact forces. Engineers concluded that the dentated profile should be replaced with a solid end sill to avoid structural damage. To understand how the riverbed would respond to high energy discharges, the model was converted from a fixed bed to a mobile bed using crushed stone and clay representing natural river material. Scour tests were carried out for key flood scenarios. 4,000 cubic meters per second, 7,600 cubic meters per second, 9,570 cubic meters per second, and the probable maximum flood of 12,500 cubic meters per second. During free flow tests, the maximum scour depth gradually increased from elevation 958 meters to elevation 950 meters as flow increased. Under gated conditions, scour became deeper and more aggressive. Operating two gates instead of all three created asymmetric turbulence. The combination of the center and right bays produced the worst scour, cutting the bed down to elevation 950 meters, significantly deeper than expected. When engineers later removed the splitter wall between the spillway and the debris channel, scour depth increased by almost one meter under free flow and by nearly nine meters under gated flow. The absence of the splitter wall created strong reverse currents along the right side of the stilling basin, pushing the main jet toward the left bank and intensifying erosion. After reviewing the results, the design consultants recommended several modifications. The air vents in the breast wall of the spillway needed to be sealed because their presence caused flow separation and raised water levels during high discharge. The splitter wall between the spillway and the debris flow channel had to be restored because its absence created dangerous circulation patterns. The dentated end sill needed to be replaced with a solid end sill to withstand high velocity flows. The downstream slope of the stilling basin invert should be flattened from a ratio of 1 in 5 to 1 in 10, reducing the tendency of the hydraulic jump to shift downstream. And finally, the splitter wall was redesigned as a stepped wall, with its top lowered from elevation 982 to 976 meters. This reduced reverse flow while still separating the spillway discharge from the debris channel. Once these changes were implemented in the model, engineers observed clear improvements. Return flow from the right side decreased significantly, the hydraulic jump became more stable, and scour depth improved by roughly 2 meters. Flow distribution downstream became more uniform, reducing the risk of long-term erosion. The debris flow channel was tested for discharges between 800 and 1200 cubic meters per second. The channel performed well, allowing floating debris to enter smoothly and exit with high velocity. Mild flow separation occurred along the right abutment, but it did not significantly affect performance. Log booms installed upstream of the dam intercepted all floating debris, guiding it safely toward the spillway and into the debris flow channel. This ensured that the intake structure received clear water free from floating material. The intake and the desander block were also examined. Engineers measured velocities at multiple points for flows of 290, 500, and 1200 cubic meters per second. The results showed that velocities in the approach channel and the sedimentation basins were extremely low, mostly below 0.25 meters per second, ensuring that even fine sediments settled before reaching the headrace tunnel.
the sediment trapped in the basins could be flushed through the it flushing canal. Too, However, sediment accumulating in the upstream approach channel might require additional attention, since velocities there were not always sufficient to mobilize material. In summary, the hydraulic model study confirmed that the NJHEP dam layout is generally sound, and performs well under both normal and extreme flood scenarios. The spillway operates safely up to the 100-year flood. At extreme flows, vortex formation and flow deflection require careful design adjustments. A solid end sill and step splitter wall significantly improve energy dissipation and reduce scour. The debris flow channel effectively removes floating debris. The desander prevents sediment from entering the headrights, and some improvements are needed in the approach channel for efficient sediment flushing. This hydraulic model study played a crucial role in refining and safeguarding, one of the most complex hydropower systems at NJHEP. Through detailed testing and continuous improvement, engineers ensured that the project would operate safely under all conditions, from normal flows to the most extreme floods imaginable. Thank you for listening to this in-depth engineering exploration.